fun. Hey, welcome to week seven and the final week of our post-game chat. I'm Ken Primo from Mercer Road Northeast. We've got some of our teaching team here, Kareen and uh, Darren Earlywine. And then we've got downtown location pastor of John Jones. And we, uh, our two churches, uh, have been going through a, a series called Made for More, which we're unpacking the book of Ephesians together. And every Tuesday, we get on a Zoom call and talk about the sermons. And so we just thought throughout this series, we would uh, record some of our conversations as we're growing and learning from one another and wanted to share that with you all and, and uh, give you a little bit more perspective on the passage that we're studying. And so this is the Last week, final one, and we are looking at Ephesians chapter 6. And so Ephesians chapter 6, uh, for me, I kind of just focused in, uh, preached uh, on Sunday and focused in beginning on verse 10. And so this is the passage that uh, talks about the armor of God. And if you've grown up in church, uh, we at, in the kids ministry love this passage because then we get like real, you know, plastic armor out or you got the vinyl graph or whatever and we love to go piece by piece explaining uh how the symbolism of it and how you can put on the armor of god uh we didn't do that this sunday uh sorry to disappoint you uh but we we kind of looked at some of the bigger themes that were going on in the passage uh and and the big thing that that god was kind of challenging me and and i was trying trying to encourage our church in is is recognizing i, I talked about an analogy of of on D-Day, which uh, happy Memorial Day weekend uh, this this past weekend here uh, on D-Day and, and, and recognizing that all of these soldiers going into the, the beaches of Normandy were not expecting to go on vacation, right? They knew there was a battlefield. They knew that there was an enemy who was trying to destroy them. Um, and just realizing, I think for a lot of us in, in our everyday lives, like we, we, the enemy deceives us into not believing that that Satan's real, not believing that demons are real. Uh, and so we go about our lives just looking at the physical world. Uh, mm. we, we see the flesh and blood, as the text says, and we think our battle is against flesh and blood. You know, the neighbor that is annoying, uh, the coworker or boss who's um, getting you upset, your ex-spouse, uh, they're the issue. It's a flesh and blood issue, and all we look at is the physical world, but uh, realizing that there is a spiritual war going on, that there's a spiritual battle going on. And so how do we have, you know, Paul's giving this, this perspective in uh, Ephesians 6 of recognizing there's a war, there's an enemy. And so how do we, as the people of God, participate in this? How do we put on the armor of God? How do we fight in this battle in a way that honors the Lord and uh, relies on his power and his strength. Uh, and so I, I think the first part there of just recognizing like shifting perspective before you even get even to the practical, how do you do this? But like recognizing every day there's battles going on in the spiritual realm. And I think sometimes we, we don't think about that at all. We just think I'm just living for comfort. I'm just living vacation. I'm just living. And my battles might just be against, the flesh and blood things that I can see touch experience on a daily basis. So how, what's God been teaching you and growing you guys and in, in helping you to understand, yeah, kind of the spiritual reality behind, you know, the physical world we live in. Yeah. I think you one know, of the balances for, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, no, hit it. I think one of the things that is, is so key about that, Ken, as you talked about is just getting to the place where, we're starting each day, you know, with a cognitive, cognitive understanding that there is a battle going on, you know, and, you know, we were talking, you know, this morning in, in my discipleship about it with the guys, you know, they were just processing some Kairos moments going on in their life, a family, work, all the stuff that you kind of, you know, laid out. And one of the things we talked about is, you know, I think one of the enemy's, you know, greatest ploys is to try to get us to, to believe that we're alone. Mm you know, in this struggle, like it's you against the world and in your mind, it's me against the world. And it's like, you're saying flesh and blood. I've got these problems with my boss or with this or whatever. And, you know, I told them this morning, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that, you know, is looking for the devil under every rock, you know, where it's like, 
you stub your toe and you're like, oh, the devil's out for me today. It's like, no, you might just be clumsy. You know what I mean? But like, but at the same time realizing, you know, throughout everything I'm going through, you know, am I spiritually and mentally, emotionally and cognizant that for one, no matter what's happening, I'm not alone. Right. Two, I do like, I do have this armor. I do have strength and I do have, as we've talked about, you know, the idea of identity in this whole series and looking even at that kingdom triangle, like I do have a new identity in Christ. I am who he says I am. I'm not alone, but I've also been given the authority and power, you know, to, to live this life. And um, I don't know that we start most days as that, as a, as a starting place or in most days with that as a reflection point, you know? Hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is why does this section have to be put into scripture, right? It's, it's, you got to ask those kinds of questions when you're reading the Bible. And when you realize that this section on armor is coming against the backdrop that just, although you didn't cover it on Sunday morning, there, there's a backdrop of, Hey, how do you correctly order the most important roles inside of your life, um, whether a child, parent, or a boss, or basically like an employee, uh, something. How, how do you act in such a way that your relationships are ordered correctly in the way that God wants it done? And then right after all the roles that he talks about, he dives in saying, hey, and in, in verse 10 there, by the way, the the uh, the phrase in the NIV, it says, finally, be strong. That's kind of actually a misinterpretation of the verb under the surface there. It's it's be strengthened more is kind of the concept. Be strengthened in the Lord. Be strengthened in God and in his mighty power. And why would he need to say that unless there's 100% a reason for it, right? And so, like Darren said, I, I don't think sensationalism is always, like, the best attribute but i think a, a, a increased sensitivity and awareness has to be a part of the christian existence that if you are so numb that you don't see the spiritual world showing up anywhere in your life at all um that maybe just maybe you need to be tuned back into where god is at and what he's doing hmm. and in in that and you can go to one of two extremes which we talked about on sunday of one is like yeah it is never showing up <laughs> There is no, you know, belief practically in the supernatural. And it's just all what you can see and experience. Uh, or on the other side is, yeah, under every rock, there's there's a demon. Um, and I think that you can go to either extreme. And I think many of us, though, are on this side of uh, in our, our church of, uh, yeah, living our lives without an awareness, without an attentiveness to the fact that there is a spiritual war going on, uh, which then, like you're saying, you're not sensitive to the fact of, like, I need God to strengthen me to so I can live out who he's called me to be in my relationships, in my workplace, in my family. Um, but we need to know, like, I need God's power because there is a battle going on and I need to rely on him. Well, and dude, I think we have to be really careful to, when we approach this passage, not to convince ourselves or trick ourselves into thinking that the spiritual war that's happening is a Star Wars style, good against dark kind of attribute, because the war is already won, right? God, God has won this war through Jesus, through everything that has been done. The devil is not his like co-opposite that can like fight back against him. You know, he's created by God and Therefore, the the battle is actually against us, right? It's not God cannot be defeated inside of this. We're not fighting for God's honor. We're not fighting for God's, you know, sovereignty over the world and hoping that we can defeat the devil and take him down at the last second so that you know he doesn't get the ring of power or something like that. Like, none of this stuff is happening, right? That the reality is that the battle is us versus the forces of darkness. Because if he can destroy us, he can remove us from the presence of God and from relationship with God Himself. Mm. And John, I would I would add to that the battle is against the principalities of this of this world, and yeah. I think your point was even before the passage that that we were looking at, it's an upside down kingdom. So even though you have the power, you relinquish the power. Even though, I mean, he's flipping everything that the culture would have said gives you the rights yeah. to give away your rights. So I think that 
the the pieces, the res, you know, resisting the ways of the world when it comes to who's on top and who's on bottom. The first will be last, last will be. So it's that whole idea of his kingdom is coming. His kingdom is here because Christ has come, but his kingdom is not completely fulfilled yet. So that war is about how do we bring the kingdom to the very spheres of influence that we have. And often mm -hmm. that's going to be countercultural to our day, but it's also going to be countercultural to me because I'm going to want what's mine. I'm going to want, if I, you know, we don't, we're, you know, he talks about slavery. If I'm the master, I get all the say, but he flips that upside down. And then he even says, there is no slaves. There are no masters. So I think that's an interesting thing. Like, what is he addressing in that culture that um, is resistant to the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. And well, recognize it. Careful to, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you got to be careful too inside of American culture to Corinne's point. Like, we are a, for better or for worse, a violent society at this point, right? Like we are violent with our thoughts, with our words, like phys physically speaking, you know, we have more shootings than anywhere else in the world. And so a lot of times, I think when you read this passage, it's very possible that you look at this as like your trump card over a lot of other people, right? Where all of a sudden now I can like, I've got the, the, the weapons, I've got the battle stuff. Let's, let's go to war against things that I don't like or things that mm. I perceive that God might not like. Right. And that's not what the passage is telling us to do. It's talking about being strengthened to withstand the, the, the battle coming against us. Right. And, and to be, joining in with what the spirit is doing, like Kareem said, to, to bring heaven on earth, man. So I just think, be careful that you, we don't overread our own cultural narratives into it. Yeah. And you see the countercultural aspect of even right before this talks about marriage of like, okay, if we're going to fight for our marriage, it says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Like mm -hmm. husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Like the way Jesus fought for us, right, was sacrificial love. Um, so even in that, if thinking about, yeah, like as we're battling, we're going to use the the weapons, quote unquote, of the kingdom of God, which is like sacrificial love towards others. It's peacemaking. It's, you know, like it's countercultural. Uh, it's not just fighting for me and what I want. Yeah. It's laying down your life for another. Well, I think it's interesting that in the passage, he doesn't say, put all this armor on and charge, you know, go after it. Like he says, you know, stand firm. And then he says again, stand firm. <laughs> like, you know, like th this isn't a, a violent charge forward. It's I'm strengthened and I'm going to stand my, you know, my ground here. And I think, um, you know, even that posture speaks to that. Well, if you look at verse 19, it also ties in where Paul's at. Cause you got to remember dude's in prison about to get like put on yeah. trial. And he says, Hey, pray that I'll be fearless, which why does he need to pray for fearlessness unless he is scared out of his mind. Right. And mm -hmm. the scariness of it is he's about to go to Rome and literally speak to the powers mm -hmm. that be at that point in time that are defining, defining how culture works, defining how life functions, defining all this. And he's about to bring the gospel to bear this upside down kingdom to that. And I think sometimes we, we forget that it's okay to be scared, but it's also okay to say, God, make me fearless in the face of that. Like that in our time period, standing up for, you know, Jesus and standing up for this, well, you don't stand up for Jesus, but you, you live out the kingdom and bring the kingdom to bear inside of the world. And that can be a scary thing sometimes because people reject us and Paul's probably about to get rejected. And, well, not probably, he will get rejected and he'll get killed for it. But I just think you got to tie that fearlessness back in there too, to be like, hey, this is all kind of a wild thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's weird too, right? It's like, you look at from after he writes this letter to the rest of his life, like from an earthly perspective, it'd be easy to write the narrative that like, dude, you lost, <laughs> right? Like you did, you stood your ground, you spoke in Rome, and then, then you were killed, like you died, you know? And so it's like, I think that makes it even you know more confusing of like, where I think 
and I'm sure I probably assume this too often too, that it's like, you know, I know I'm in the center of God's will. If ever, if I'm safe and I'm winning, mm -hmm. like, let me pray for the armor of God. So I and my family are safe and I'm winning. And if, if any of that's not happening, then I assume God has rejected me or I'm not doing it right. Or I failed. And you look at Paul and it's like that, you know, that wasn't his perspective at all. In fact, you know, in another one of his letters to, to for him to say like, Hey, like for me to die is, you know, is gain. And, you know, that's a, that's a different level of understanding and, and the spiritual and physical. And for him to see like the spiritual fruit was all of these people that he left behind that whose life had went from darkness to light and these communities of faith, mm -hmm. small as they were, that sprung up all throughout, you know, the Roman kingdom but for the kingdom of God, that was the fruit. And even though he laid down his life. So. What, one thing that, that uh, sorry, I was gonna say what, one thing that, that stood out to me too in this passage is uh, the emphasis on prayer, like 18, 19, 20, those verses, the amount of times he talks about prayer and then he asks for prayer for himself as well. And uh, recognizing for us, like, we we engage in this battle through prayer and reliance on God, like standing firm, being strong in the Lord requires like us growing in our prayer lives and communicating God and calling on him and, and interacting with him in prayer. So recognize that we've got to fight these battles in prayer. We've got to do that together. Like you said, Darren, like it's not about us being alone. Uh, all of this was like plural to the church, the body of Christ, not just us individuals, but us standing together in prayer. Um, and I've just sensed in my own life of like the more that we engage in wanting to bring the, the kingdom of God here on earth, like the more we need to be people of prayer um, and, mm -hmm. and standing our gr the ground in prayer. Uh, and just a real quick example of that is a um, couple of days ago, I was just praying for my neighborhood. So we moved into a new neighborhood two years ago. Uh, we were, you know, there's, you know, Christians in the neighborhood, uh, but uh, we were the first family at, from Mercer Road Northeast, uh, you know, moving to the neighborhood. Uh, two years later, you know, I was just praying about there's three other families on our street now who go to our church, um, you know, that we've been able to influence and they've uh, become part of Mercer Road Northeast. And I was just praying and, uh, and just convicted of prayer and fasting and praying for, for God to break through in, in our neighborhood. And, and God put on my heart in a, a journal, like, Lord, what if it went from three families on this street to 30 in the next three years? Like what would need, need to happen and begin to pray for that, you know? And God gave me a heart to, to pray that, to see, you know, his light in our neighborhood. And I literally walk outside to go sit on my front porch and there is a dad and his 10 year old kid standing on my lawn, <laughs> staring at me <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, hello. And so uh, they were asking me, the kid loved our tree. We've got a willow tree out front and his favorite tree in the neighborhood. And he's like, where'd you get the tree? You know, so we start talking and, this, you know, I quickly realized, you know, they're, they're not connected to a church. I start telling them what I do and all that stuff. And it began a conversation. But it was like a tangible I pray, God, like, help us be a family that could have even more influence in the neighborhood. I go outside, and God so brought <laughs> someone to our, my lawn, like, standing on my lawn in that moment. And I just see God, you know, show up in those types of ways where it's like, like, let's pray for God to move. Let's be people of prayer um, and, and, and raise the fervency of, like, our prayer life, just like someone would if you were in the trenches, you know in the battlefield, like your prayer life's going to go up because, you know, versus I'm laying on the beach in Hawaii. Um, I might not even be, my, my prayer life might be, thanks God, this is awesome. But I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, fervently praying for survival in that moment. So I just think that a practical thing for us is like, we've got to fight these battles in prayer and reliance on the Lord. Well, Ken, I love that example that you give because in verse 18, when he says all kinds of prayers, 
like we I, I don't think we think of prayer that way sometimes you know you think of it more as just the like either the wish list or the like god make me strong so i conquer the world today somehow or make me safe and there's such an imaginative aspect to prayer that sometimes we miss out on that you know you will you will find out more about your spiritual life by the things that you imagine being capable of doing with God. Um, that that will show you and determine for you a lot of like what's possible in the kingdom of heaven, right? Is like, what do you want? What, what do you desire? What do you hope for? What is it that your brain just, when you don't have anything else, no load on it? What are the things that pop in your head to be like, you know, it'd be really cool. Is there were like 30 families in my neighborhood. And, and, and then all of a sudden it gives you that creative imagination to see it happening there. And that all kinds of prayers is not just a defensive type of prayer. It's not just an offensive type of prayer. It's an imaginative sense of creating. And I love that example so much, man. I love to pray the prayer that um, just God, give me your eyes to see. And it, mm -hmm. it's kind of that, that scary one, because then when you begin to see those things, the question is, will you step into that? And so even if you think mm -hmm. about your neighbors, you know, some of that is if you, you know, you notice something, a car has been gone for a long time or whatever that situation is to be brave enough sometimes just to knock on the door and, and ask the question like, Hey, how are you? Or, I noticed this, or could I help you mow your, instead of me getting mad at my neighbor who doesn't mow their grass, like, gosh, what would it be like if I actually just went and mowed it for them and, and didn't mm. make assumptions about bad neighboring. Maybe I'm the bad neighbor because I have no idea what's going on in that house or what's happening in their life. That maybe is the reason they're not doing the things I'd like them to do. So sometimes I think it's so much more simple than then we make it out mm -hmm. to be like, that's fighting the battle. You matter to me. And I care enough to, to cross that, that line or open that gate. Mm -hmm. And that's that gospel of peace kind of idea, right? From verse 15, where it's talking mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, get your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace looks at your neighbor and says, oh, maybe you're not actually the issue. Like, let me take care of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is so much more tangible than we think it is. Mm -hmm. I well, know you didn't dive into it too much, or you said you weren't going to, Ken. Um, but even looking through the breakdown of the armor, you know what I mean, of like what that means, you know what I mean, having this belt of truth, you know what I mean, that you know truth matters. It's not just your feelings or your just your emotions about something or your opinion about something. And like that, I that that idea of that breastplate of righteousness, like of everything we've talked about of who we are because of Christ saying, like I mean. It's it's what he puts on us, you know what I mean, and that idea of you know the the you know shoes of peace, and then you know the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, knowing that he is giving us some instruction that that you know like why do you need to be in in you know in the word regularly, you know, so you don't feel guilty that you didn't have your devotions, like no, like being able to to know the word and and have it in your heart in your mind, giving access to the Holy Spirit to bring it up, like. You look at how Jesus fought temptation, you know, and, and, you know, how he answered the devil in his temptation back with the word of God. And so there is that part where, you know, it, there some of the offensive side of the fighting is about the spiritual growth, right? Like I have thoughts, you know what I mean, that I know are not from God, but because I've hidden the word of God in my heart, you know, I can grab the sword of the, of the spirit, right? And I can speak truth back to lies in my life and like, it, you know, there's no violence in there, but in the spiritual realm, I am able to stand my ground and then, you know, use the sword of the spirit as a way to, to win that battle. You know what I mean? And in some ways I am just standing firm, but if I don't have, if that's not in me, I don't have access to it. Um, and I think that's, that speaks to, like I said, motivation for why we want to be in the word of God regularly, not just so we can check the box, but so we're, we're ready to, to, to go to battle against the lies that are going to come against us. It's good. Well, I think we should wrap this final session up. Um, and I just want to encourage you all. Hopefully you've been journeying with us through the entire uh, six chapters of the book of Ephesians and, uh, our prayer has been that through this, uh, first of all, that you'd understand your identity, like who God has made you to be, that you're a loved child of God. And read through the first three chapters of seeing all that God has done for you and all he's called you to be, that you've been made for more. 
and then seeing chapters four, five, and six of how this plays out then in what we do, in our behaviors, in our relationships, in our everyday lives, uh, that what you believe about who you are actually matters and plays itself out in our lives. And uh, our prayer is that through that, that you would be like rooted and grounded in God's love for you so that you can create the the future reality that God has for your family, for your workplace, for your neighborhood uh, that's on his heart and his mind that he uh, wants to, to bring light into dark places. And God wants you, your life to shine that light uh, as you find your identity in him and live it out in your life circumstances. So hope this uh, series has been helpful for you. This is going to be the last one for us to do this post-game chat. Maybe we'll bring this back, though. Uh, maybe down the road, some other series, we'll, we'll dive in again. But thankful for you all who have journeyed with us through this. Thanks for watching this video. And we hope that it has been uh, impactful in your life. Thanks for joining. Bye.